Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Allison Werder, and I'm here to welcome you to the Dean's Lunchtime Chat on Inspiring Innovation in Teaching and Learning. Uh, just a couple housekeeping measures before we get started. Um, as you just heard, hopefully today's webinar will be recorded and, and we'll have it av available for viewing at a later time. But by joining the session, you are giving consent to be part of the uh, recorded program. Um, you'll notice at the bottom that there is a Q&A uh, function. If you have questions during the course of this webinar, please feel free to submit them at any time. Uh, we will bubble them up to the moderator and try and get to all of the questions during the course of the conversation or at the end. And we hope to answer as many as possible. Uh, please note that participants' cameras and microphones will be disabled throughout the webinar um, and the chat function will not be available. So thank you so much for joining us. I'm now going to turn it over to Dean Massey uh, to start the program. Thanks, Allison. Well, hello everybody. And thanks for joining us again um, over this lunchtime chat series. This is the third of five that we are running this spring. Um, each chat is focusing on one of Eisenberg's key priorities and the variety of initiatives that we have in place and that we're thinking about that underlie and will drive each of the priorities success. Um, you may recall if you joined us in January, we talked about Eisenberg's priority of enabling career success. We had a great conversation with Holly Lawrence, our assistant dean for the Office of Career Success, about the variety of ways that we're trying to expand access, including building those uh, Eisenberg digital assets to support not only our undergrads, but our graduate students and you, our alumni. So stay tuned. With that. that is continuing to unfold. Last month, we had the opportunity to talk about initiatives in support of our priority of creating global citizens and inclusive leaders at Eisenberg. We heard from a couple of our key staff people along with two wonderful undergraduate students that talked about things that we're doing with the global citizens um, area along with um, uh, our diversity, equity and inclusion office and the programs that they've been running. So that was also very exciting. Today, we're focusing on another topic, another priority, and that is inspiring innovation in teaching and learning. And this, frankly, is one of my favorite topics um, and areas that I'm most excited about, not to negate the other four areas, I must say. Um, certainly, we could argue that the whole purpose of a business school is to foster innovation and develop innovators. And I would argue that our faculty and their staff are, are true innovators and true innovators in the space of teaching and learning. We have to, as a school, to maintain our competitive, competitiveness among the best business schools, continue to develop the skills of our faculty and staff at, at the cutting edge of technologies, pedagogies, and approaches to teaching and learning. And so this is what we're gonna be talking about today. Um, in doing so, our goal, of course, is to ensure that our students and, and ultimately those students as graduates are really prepared to enter the workforce and work with their organizations and have the tools, techniques, and skills uh, readily available to them. So let me uh, introduce some faculty who are kind enough to join us uh, this, for this noontime chat. And they're gonna be offering and sharing some insights and experiences that they've had on these topics related to teaching and learning. But first, let me just introduce again, Allison Werder, who you just met a minute ago. Allison is our Assistant Dean and Chief Marketing Officer and she's gonna help manage and uh, uh, lead some Q&A a little bit later on in the session. So we've asked Allison to play that role for us today. Um, a lot of you in our audience as alumni um, probably know uh, uh, some of our faculty here today, in particular, Shirley Smirling. Shirley is a senior lecturer too in operations and information management, my home department, okay? And also Pam Trafford, she is also a senior lecturer too in the Department of Accounting. Shirley and Pam, and I'm very proud to share this with everyone, you may have seen an announcement over the last year, were named Eisenberg Teaching Fellows this past year. The Teaching Fellows program is but one example of an initiative that we have put in place that is intended to drive innovation and inspire teaching and learning within Eisenberg. We started it last year, just as the realities of the pandemic were unfolding, and we thought this was a wonderful program. I'll describe it a little bit more. Shirley and Pam, along with three other faculty members, Susan Boyer and OIM, Melissa Baker, HTM, and Bob Napestein from OIM, were also named fellows. Um, we couldn't have everybody here today, so we're very happy that Pam and Shirley were able to join us. Just briefly, the purpose of the Eisenberg uh, Teaching Fellows Program 
is really to leverage the expertise of our outstanding instructors. And in this case, this past year in particular, we were looking at faculty who had a great deal of experience using technology in the classroom and teaching online. So these five faculty fellows represent some of the best faculty with that experience that we needed to leverage in order to um, really help our faculty across the school as we shifted to fully remote learning um, late last spring, a year ago, I can't believe it's a year ago, and then into the fall and as we've continued even into this spring. Um, these teaching fellows have been a huge help to their colleagues throughout the school and we're gonna learn more about what they did. We're also very lucky to have with us Gregory Thomas. Gregory is the executive director of the Perfume Center for Entrepreneurship. Some of our alums may have been engaged with the center during your time here. Um, the center lives in Eisenberg, but in fact serves the entire UMass campus and community and does all sorts of work regionally in the Pioneer Valley, working with local entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs as well. Gregory also teaches in Eisenberg, and he's gonna share with us a demo of a 3D immersive platform that the center is going to be leveraging and using going forward. I'm very excited about that. So why don't we start with Gregory? Um, uh, Gregory, uh, Gregory's been a wonderful colleague to work with in this space, and the 3D immersive platform um, that we're gonna be uh, getting a demo of today and talking about is, um, is very exciting to me because this space, as many of you know, I've talked about before, I've studied collaboration in organizations for almost 30 years, and in the last 10 years, have done a lot of research with regard to 3D virtual platforms. And so Gregory and I got talking about it. So Gregory, to get started in the conversation, can you share with us, the audience, a little bit of background in the center and how you work with students so that we kind of have a context for, for how things operate in your shop? Yeah, and, and the, the Bethune Center is, is here to service the, the Chancellor's mission um, and the Eisenberg School's uh, directive of um, ensuring that the University of Massachusetts is the destination of choice for students, faculty, staff, and our community who want to engage in, in entrepreneurship and innovation. And so with that, um, um, our Innovation Challenge series where students compete um, is, is a part of that, a four-part series where they compete with their pitch decks. Um, um, in addition to that, we have a, uh, an incubator space on campus, but since the pandemic, the students haven't been able to interact in that incubator space. They haven't been able to, to, to meet there and, and hang out and, and help each other. And when you have on campus an entrepreneurial mindset, when you have innovators, one of the important things is the collisions that happen in that space. And so, Dean, um, uh, what we started to talk about in our one-on-one -on -one was, I'm not getting these collisions that I want. How can, <laughs> how can we facilitate that? And that, that As you might imagine, when, when Gregory came to me and was talking about collisions, I was getting a little bit worried, but, but then, <laughs> then I understood. So normally, Gregory, with the students and the teams, you normally work face-to-face -face with them. Um, and so you're, they, describe a little bit about the challenges that you were hearing from the students. I know we were using Zoom, we've used Zoom extensively, but what were some of the challenges you were having working with the students and then the students were having working with each other? Yeah, with, uh, with the students, especially in, in the fall when, we, when, when, when they didn't have their, their dorm room space or they didn't have private space, the students didn't want to turn their videos on. They didn't want to really engage that way. And, and that, was, that was tough. Um, uh, we, we, we coined it Zoom fatigue, but the students were experiencing as, as faculty um, in our classes, we're being encouraged to engage with the students. It's tough to engage with a, a name on a black screen or someone's photo. Um, on, on our end and on their end, as you know, and we have um, um, Berthume MBA fellows or MBA students who their fellowship um, is, is to, uh, to help our entrepreneurs uh, to get better. And even in those meetings, the, the MBA fellows were um, uh, meeting with the students, uh, quote unquote, face to face. But the students didn't want to turn their videos on us. So it's tough to get engagement, read body language and, and, and those things um, because the students, they wanted time out from Zoom. And, and I think, um, and it's Gregory and I started having conversations about this. And of course I had, I, I was immediately um, intrigued by his problem. And this is how we started to discuss. I su suggested to him, I said, you should take a look at some 3D 
platforms and 3D immersive platforms. Students will be familiar with them at some level. Most of our students have played video games at some point in their lives, Fortnite, whatever it is. And so um, Gregory was quite intrigued and I sent him along a few examples. And then Gregory, why don't you explain what you had? I think the okay. students picked it up from there. And um, we, we engaged uh, two groups of students to look at uh, the, uh, the, the opportunities out there, let's call them that, the, the online opportunities or the opportunity to, to kind of gamify the interaction. Um, um, and uh, they, Verbella um, was the one of the three that they looked at that they, they liked. The, the graphics were the best. They were able to, to move around and interact um, freely. And the, uh, the ability to, to share screen, to, to web surf, um, and um, to be in private space uh, like you are uh, on on campus, so to speak, the the Zoom video, uh, and, and we talk about and uh, I, I I like to say this I don't I think I think it's going to um, uh, uh, steer away, but I, I like to say that it's truly virtual versus right now and you and I this we haven't sent our avatar right we're in person I like to call this online. But in today's world, we have uh, transitioned this to talk about it's a, a virtual webinar. But it, it, Verbella or the the online tools that we explored were truly um, virtual. Um, it wasn't a virtual reality with the glasses, but it was um, the first step towards virtual, where you send an avatar to interact. Well, why don't we um, uh, we have a recorded video of the Verbella space that uh, Gregory and the, the students have set up and that we'll be using. And for those of you who are familiar with it, in these spaces, um, you as a user um, have an avatar, right? That you are, that is your agency within the space. And what I particularly like, if, you know, what we're in Zoom right now, we can share screens. We may be able to use a Google Docs and we can do things like that. But we really can't go any place together unless I pick up my laptop and you walk through through my house, which I know people have done in, in Zoom meetings. But Gregory, why don't we take a look and we can maybe talk over the the uh, uh, video. If Allison, if you want to start the video for us so that our alumni friends can see. Fabulous. So this is um, and as as you um, you. You see my avatar and you see uh, John there from uh, uh, Eisenberg's technology um, um, support team and Carly Fricata just waved at us. Um, Carly is the program director uh, for the Bethune Center and leads all of our student facing programs. And you see the blue line around, this is a space in Verbella, kind of the entry space where we can meet up and decide where we want to go. Um, and so we're uh, just just chatting here, uh, working through um, uh, where where we want to go next. And I think John says, "Well, hey, why don't why don't we go to uh, the the Dean Suite?" Um, and and we uh, we walk there. Be uh, great, Allison. If you let it play, I've I've got it um, fairly memorized. I'll take us through that um, with Ann. And Ann, we did a test with this with you and 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 Susan Boyer, right? We met here and you almost like in Star Trek, I don't know if I'm, I'm dating myself there, but in Star Trek, you almost transport to, yes. um, where, where you want where you, to, to go, right? Yeah. You just, you just pick where you want to go. And, and, uh, you can see for folks that the kind of the map of the larger space is in that lower right-hand corner, but you can go um, uh, to, and you can also see in the upper left-hand corner who, what users are actually in the world right now. Um, and you can either uh, chat uh, via text or, you know, on the screen, or you can uh, actually have verbal. We're not hearing the, the sound right now. Yeah, and um, um, uh, we, we had some of the students on here. We'll, we'll see that when we, when we get there, but we are um, um, very quickly here going to, um, to transport uh, to uh, to your office um, and 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 do and do work in your office, or at least we're going to pretend okay. to for this video. Uh, we're going to transport to your office. You see, uh, you see there. Um, um, we're we've come into your office, and your your photo was there because we have the the website up. Um, uh, the uh, Eisenberg website is also up. Uh, you can change the configuration, but we have it set up so we can just sit down and, and work. And John and Carly and I are are in here, um, and we can control what's on th those two screens. And the other cool thing about this is 
uh, um, in your space, you control the branding. And so you see there the, the Eisenberg brand, but that could um, very easily be how when we're in the Eisenberg Business Innovation Hub and there are spaces named for our, our, our prominent donors. So this could be the Dean Space, um, uh, let's just use my name. I like that. The, this is the Gregory Thomas Dean's office, right? Um, and then we, <laughs> then we just transported here um, with the, the, uh, the student leaders. You see Alvin and Max here. Um, Alvin and Max are the co-presidents of the Entrepreneurship Club. Alvin and Max are two of the students who helped us to evaluate this and, and chose Verbella and Anna. Um, so Alvin, Max, and Anna met with us in space. That's the Entrepreneurship Club's logo you see in the background. And here's what Alvin said in this, in this video. He said, um, this would allow us to collaborate in spaces like we can't today in Zoom. Right. Yeah. And, so he, and I, think, I think what's important, um, and Gregory and I have talked about this, and this is, I mentioned earlier, you know, colleagues and I have been studying these kinds of spaces with organizations for over 10 years now. And I think that as a result of the pandemic, as a result of everyone working remotely over the last year, they are now becoming very viable again. I think organizations are really seeing the potential value of these, the ability to work together, to leave things in these spaces. Um, we've done quite a bit of work with uh, um, some major companies that are using these spaces for training programs. Um, we've done work on the design of these spaces to drive creativity. So it's very, very exciting. And I think we're just kind of on the cusp of, of really figuring out how to leverage them both in higher education, but certainly when people go into the workforce. Right. This yeah. is a nice space, Gregory. Yeah, this, um, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Anne, for giving us the opportunity to to explore it and use it. I, I think there's more, as you just said, with respect to um, uh, classroom tools, um, auditorium tools, larger spaces, um, and uh, we'll explore those as we as we kind of uh, uh, spend more time learning about it. Yeah, yeah, and I think you'll find, um, and for those of our, our, our alums and friends that are out there watching this, you, you see this avatar and what is most interesting, the research shows that you, your avatar becomes you, right? You really get an affinity with that avatar in the space and you feel very much immersed in that space, which again, drives positive outcomes. So the more you feel like you're in the space, the, the higher the performance is. So I think it's very, very exciting, Gregory, this, oh, Gregory, I love the outside space. Here oh too. yeah, so that's that's something that the students said they wanted, right, to get out. And um, there, there's some some cool things that you can do with Verbella. You can make your avatar dance. And you I think you've seen waves a few times, hand waves like this. Um, um, and so we, uh, we spent some time uh, doing that. You, you can applaud or have the thinking position um, and, and jump up and down and really move around. And then also uh, there's some water space on Verbella with the, with the boat so we can be creative um, on, on, the, on the water. And we took a, a tour uh, around the Verbella Island um, in, in the, uh, the motorboat. <laughs> And, and I didn't tell Gregory this, but we did a, a project with a, um, a um, fitness club in California a few years back and compared, did a study comparing some members of the fitness club that were in a weight loss program. They built out a 3D space like this. They could ride bicycles in the space. They could do all sorts of things. And we compared it to people in the so-called real world and the virtual space participants um, lost as much weight as those in the real world. I mean, they were actually exercising, but it had some very positive effects. So Gregory, what's the next steps with this? Where, where are the teams headed with this? Where are you headed with this? I think this is very, very exciting. So Anne, we, we've, uh, we've purchased a license for, Berbe for Bevella to, uh, for the clubs to use it. And so the Entrepreneurship Club, the Social Entrepreneurship Club, uh, will start using Verbella this semester. Over the summer, we'll uh, use it in our Collegiate Summer Venture Program and, and test it out. And then uh, um, end of July, August, we'll make some decisions on how we move forward with uh, uh, further expanding out the Verbella space uh, for the University of Massachusetts Amherst and for the Eisenberg School of Business. That's great. And some, um, some of our faculty and some of our alums may have heard of and or had experience with um, probably the most um, 
a widely known uh, 3D platform, which was Second Life, which probably 10 plus years ago got a lot of press um, out there. And I think what we're seeing, and that, you know, it's a, a very nice platform. What I think we're seeing is some more commercial vendors entering this space with tools and technologies to support organizational work. And so that's where Brevello would fall in that. So that's wonderful. Gregory, thank you so much, um, all you're doing. Um, I know the students appreciate it, school appreciates, and this is very, very exciting. Um, and so let's um, turn our attention now to our uh, teaching fellows and Shirley and Pam um, and some of the work that you've been doing, again, as teaching fellows, along with your three other teaching fellow colleagues, but again, I'll just um, you know, reiterate to everyone the challenge that we were facing just a little less than a year ago now when we moved fully pivoted to complete remote learning after the March spring break and students didn't come back. And then certainly as we decided and when we went into the fall that things would continue online. Now, as, as our alums know, Eisenberg has a lot of experience over many years in online education but not all our faculty had that kind of experience. And not all faculty necessarily were uh, integrated uh, technology tools into their courses to the degree that other faculty did. So this was some of it. So I, I just want, and I will also share with everyone, we, we started the program, we're gonna continue the program, but we weren't exactly sure when we named these five teaching fellows how it was going to unfold. And so if, if the two of you might wanna speak to how did you come together, the five of you, and figure out how you were going to work? Because this was pretty much, a, we knew what we wanted to, we wanted you to share best practices. We had no idea how you were going to do it. So if you could share some of those things just to get us started, that would be great. Yeah, so um, I'll, I'll start with it, then Pam will, will continue. We, we really didn't know what we're doing, right? So we just, we had the, that we were told that each one of us, uh, has to do a tour of our class, like a video to show everybody, showcase like one of our courses, which first of all was which course should we show? Should I show the on online MBA? Should I show the, the undergrad that is more quantitative? You know, when you have all these things, because different way, different content and different disciplines and different formats and sizes of classes have different flavors. So the first thing was for each one of us to even decide what are we going to showcase? So, so some, and then it was kind of like we, we decided that by this day, we're all gonna have the videos and it was slowly and slowly because you're peeking, what are the others doing? And kind of like, we also didn't wanna have repetitive that we're all doing the online MBA class. So we kind of like really had a mix. And once we had these five videos, it was kind of like, wow, <laughs> what we're doing here is awesome. And then the question was, okay, how do we convey it to the, to the faculty? And so the first thing we knew is that some of the faculty are completely clueless, right? They never taught online. They resist <laughs> teaching online. Some of them said, I will never teach online. And I think this was still in the summer. We still didn't know, it. and you probably remember when was the date when they finally said, yes, you're fully remote. But there was in June, it was still kind of like, we don't we know, know yet, some of us will be. So everybody's kind of hoping that they will get what they want. Nobody knows, and here we are, and we fall in July, and everybody's online 100%. And we have faculty from all backgrounds, you know, all skill levels, and we have to get to them. So we, we really, we met a lot. The summer was very intensive <laughs> trying to figure out. And we tried to, we came up with all kinds of ideas of topics that will be important from the actual technology know-how, which luckily we had Susan Boyer who was running the TSS. So she was able to incorporate all the, the people at TSS to help with the how-to in terms of skill. Cause some people really need step-by-step -step how to do something. We wanted to try to see how do we integrate the technology so that we use it as a, for pedagogy, right? So that we can actually run the classes, as Gregory said earlier, without seeing their faces, not knowing their eye contact, whether they're on Facebook or LinkedIn, what they're doing while we're talking, how do we engage them? So we came up with call kind of ideas of topics. And then we ran a survey by the faculty to see what is of interest to them. And the other question they had is, how do they want to engage? Whether they want one-on-one -on -one meetings, they want department meetings, they want to come to webinars, they just, they don't want our help, they're going to go to CTL, you know, what do they really want? And we kind of, from these results, we figured and out- And by the way, we, Shirley, to interrupt, yeah. we, we've got about 125 faculty, so this was not a trivial um, right. <laughs> task in front of you. 
Right. And, and that you're not including the PhD students who are teaching. The, and, I forgot. And, right. there, there's a lot. We have more. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, it's about uh, 60 PhD students. That's correct. Right, right. So I'm going to share with you something quickly. Let's see where I, when, you know, something of how, um, am I sharing? Yeah, you see it yeah. now? Yep. yep. So we kind of like, you know, through a lot of meetings, we kind of figured out what are the topics we're going to focus on during the summer and what are we going to then let's see what happened. We also were clueless. We don't know. We never taught a hundred percent remote course. We did it for the online, like Pam and Melissa and Bob. We all, we all five of us had experience with the online MBA, but we didn't have a hundred percent remote with the undergrads where we're used to being in a classroom with them. So we took you know, we took the topics and we decided that we, none of us felt like we we're the experts at one thing. So we did assignment of departments just so we can actually work more one-on-one -on -one with faculty as they need to so with the con point of contact. That's what you can see here that each one of us kind of had one or two departments. You know, if it was a larger department, they only had one. If it was smaller, we had two. Uh, but then we decided to look at topics and to put our brains together. So for example, when we started, Bob and Melissa took you know, one of the topics and they ran like a webinar that we offered to the, I don't wanna call it a webinar, it's more like a session where we kind of came up with ideas, teaching them, then have a discussion talking about it. And then uh, Melissa and I ran something and then Pam and I did something. So we tried to kind of use more like a network, like we, we didn't feel like we are the experts. Putting us together was what gave the expertise to convey to the faculty. Uh, and actually, I think I'm going to give Pam to talk a little more about the details of what more of what, what, how we got to do that stuff. <laughs> Thanks, Shirley. Um, so we had we had this structure of how we were going to deliver topics uh, like Shirley just described and a couple of other things that we really felt were important and wanted to do for faculty again, because everybody we this was new to everybody. So everybody was a little bit anxious. We wanted to make sure that we created a really simple, straightforward path uh, for faculty to ask questions and get answers. And they weren't always technological questions at all. So right, we were answering questions about administrative stuff as well as pedagogy uh, and technological stuff. So as you can see in Shirley's graphic there, the way it, it really worked is that they the system was that you know anybody in accounting or business communications, for example, if they had any kind of question, they knew that they could contact me uh, and I might know the answer, but there's a good chance I might not, but at least I would know who to send them to and who they should talk to uh, to get the help. So we did that kind of simplification uh, for communication purposes. And we think that that was really successful. Faculty, it's a huge university. There are many great resources for help, but just having you know, one place where you could go and get help, uh, get sent to the right place was really, really useful. Uh, we also individually, each one of us actually contacted uh, all of the instructors uh, in our department cohorts and offered to meet with people individually. And early on, um, I think we all met with a lot of folks. We met with new instructors, uh, old instructors who just had lots of questions. There was a little bit less of that in the spring semester as everybody kind of got the rhythm and understood what they were doing. But we did a lot of one-on-one -on -one, uh, consultations with faculty. And a lot of times after we had these uh, faculty sessions where we talked about topics, that's we did a lot of questions from participants in those uh, sessions as well. They'd want to ask us some additional questions. The other thing we knew early on that we really wanted to do is, uh, was to create some sort of a knowledge repository uh, for all of these resources that we were creating. So we created, we used Blackboard Learn, it's the learning management system that we teach in. Uh, we created a course there for our faculty. We just called it uh, resources for Eisenberg teaching faculty or something like that. And we had all of the faculty, the teaching uh, PhD students, adjuncts, we had everybody that was an instructor basically enrolled in that course. Um, there was a discussion board there. Uh, so that was another means of communicating uh, with faculty, but we also used it. We knew that you know not all faculty were going to be able to attend all of our sessions and everybody needs a resource uh, when they're learning about you know new, new tools or they need to um, have tips for those things. So we put all of those kinds of resources into this Blackboard course so that faculty could access them uh, at any time. Uh, 
So we have uh, recordings of all of our videos, handouts. We have a session, a section on uh, various types of tools and how to use them. And then we also included just, you know, some common resources. So things that faculty might want to consider putting in their syllabi uh, and that kind of thing. I, I think that um, what Shirley and Pam have described is, is um, uh, you know, that notion of knowledge creation, knowledge sharing, um, uh, um, creating the knowledge repository that you're describing, these assets. And, and for those of you who joined us last month or when we talked about the Office of Career Success, we were talking about Eisenberg digital assets that we're creating to provide to students in and around um, careers, right? Um, in this case, what you've done, you have started us on a, a path towards creating digital assets that our instructional faculty can use. I mean, uh, for... Uh, Folks here remember, you know, early on a year ago, one of the things that we decided as a school was that we were going to lean into this pandemic, that whatever we did, our investments in teaching and learning, doing things remotely and, and so on, was going to be an investment in the future. And I think what, what Shirley and Pam, you've just described is just that. Um, an investment so that we're going to just keep carrying forward. Do, do you have some examples of some things that the um, uh, specific things that you shared with the faculty that um, that were real kind of innovative or or something that really moved the dial for them with regard to teaching and learning in these spaces or through the use of technology. Some some of the knowledge sharing examples. Sure, um, I think I'll I'll start by sort of providing a, a summary of a lot of the stuff that we did throughout the academic year. And then uh, Shirley will share a more specific example of some of the stuff that we did in one of our faculty sessions, uh, if that would work. Yeah. So yeah. in the summer, in addition to uh, maybe more than, there must've been more than 20 just sort of training sessions that faculty did to get up to speed on video creation, delivery, using Zoom, all of that kind of thing. Uh, we created, we had six, we called them fellow sessions or something like that. We created six fellow sessions uh, for faculty in the summer. And Shirley, we, when you saw Shirley's graphic as to how we organized them, we teamed up so that there was, and, and all of these sessions, by the way, these weren't, these were sessions where we were really talking about what Gregory talked about. We were really talking about how to, um, how to design and deliver our courses in a way that really um, engage students and increase student engagement all the way around. And we knew it was going to be especially challenging, right, uh, in remote learning kind of situations. So, for example, I'll throw a few of them out. Um, Bob and Melissa uh, created uh, uh, a session. Well, Pam, you just went on mute. We all got muted. <laughs> oh, there we go. Yeah. <laughs> I muted everybody. <laughs> <laughs> that, that would be a new one even for me. <laughs> um, and then Shirley and Bob, um, no, let's see, it was Shirley and Melissa. Mm -hmm. I did a session on using synchronous tools like Zoom and how we could use those to increase student engagement. Shirley and I did one. Uh, about asynchronous tools because our faculty were also going to be using a lot of asynchronous tools in this special pandemic period. So we all sort of switched off and on uh, and did those kinds of sessions. And we were, it was wonderful. We had great participation from the faculty, great questions. Uh, we learned as much from them as they learned from us. And the, the process worked really well. Uh, so we felt good and we decided that that was a, an excellent way uh, to communicate and collaborate with faculty. So we continued that on into the fall. And then in the fall, we had four more sessions and they were more aimed at um, sort of specific teaching needs because by this time everybody was trained and you know was in the classroom and doing their own kind of things. So we talked about things like testing online, um, managing discussion boards, that kind of thing. And then towards the end of fall semester, uh, we designed a survey because we wanted to get feedback from students about you know, what they were liking, what wasn't working. And we really used the feedback from that student survey to determine what our focus was going to be for spring. Uh, and for example, one of the things that, that we knew was really important for students was that there, there was always gonna be the small minority of students that would become disengaged. And it was difficult 
Uh, we wanted to make sure that we could find those students right away and help them get them back engaged with our classes really early on. So we did a session just on tracking student performance. And some of that was you know, figuring out how to use the digital tools we had uh, to do that uh, and alerting faculty to how they could use those. But we also talked about you know, the bigger issue was, which was once you identify those students, uh, if you've reached out to them and you keep reaching out to them that you're still not able to get them to respond to you, what are the next steps? So we really talked also with faculty about, you know, next steps. Um, how, what do we do when we have an unresponsive student? How do we get them back engaged in the classroom? Uh, so we talked about those kinds of things. Another, another challenge um, in remote teaching was group learning. So we also had a, a great session on um, strategizing for group work and, and teams uh, online. Uh, Shirley, you wanna share? Uh, some yeah. specifics about one of our sessions? Uh, sure, let me make sure I find the right one to share. <laughs> okay, so um, this is an example. So all our sessions, we try to do it like more like what we're doing now, not just a lecture, but more like a session. So we had some structure, obviously, but we tried also to engage the faculty in a discussion too, because we were, you know, we are kind, we're not really experts. We kind of like have experience and common sense and our own expertise in different things. But, uh, you know, for example, in January, we wanted to figure out to learn after we had the survey in the fall of students, we got the students' perspective of what worked for them and didn't work for them in the fall. We wanted to incorporate that, hear from the faculty, share that with the faculty, what the students say, hear from the faculty and try to improve the teaching in the spring. So this is an example of a session that we had in, in January, which I think we probably had around 40 people uh, in the session, 40 faculty. Um, and we, you know, after talking, sharing with them stuff, we did breakout rooms in Zoom. And then we utilized the Google, you know, it's Google Slides. It's basically the Google workspace. And you can see here, room, you know, different uh, people were in the room for names, you know, for privacy, we just put in some initials here. But as they were talking in their small discussion rooms of four to five people about their challenges, what they had and what ideas they have. So it wasn't just what we think, you know, this is what you need to do. It's what people, faculty are really sharing ideas, what worked for them, what didn't work for them. And remember, some people are teaching 200 students in a class. Some people are teaching 20. Some people are teaching something quantitative. Something is a management. It is more completely just discussion based. So it was like really, you know, brainstorming. And then we had a whole uh, class, this, you know, like I don't call it classes, everybody, this, you know, kind of sharing what the groups did. So you can see here on the left side that there are like, you know, the little slides that what every group did, you know, in their little breakout room. And then after the session, because obviously we couldn't address all the challenges, then we as uh, fellows went back to the Google Doc and added our own comments on what um, you know, faculty was saying that their challenges gave them ideas for resources. And then we shared all of this with the faculty. Now what this did, and this is an example of how we were running, I mean, each session is slightly different, but the idea was to really share with the faculty and get more information from the faculty, both on their challenges and ideas of how to solve them. And slowly building this knowledge repository of how can we really provide quality instruction and right now in a re completely remote um, setting, right? And it's online, it's like the people that were in the session and then people that couldn't come, they had the recording, but they also had access to this when more information was running on an asynchronous. So the extent of what exactly faculty, you know, access and what not, you know, we don't know exactly, we can track it if we had the time to track everything, but that's not important. It's the important is that the information is there and we're sharing the information. And beyond that, what this provide is actually providing an example for faculty of what they can do in their classes so that they can engage students both synchronously and asynchronously. So this is just an example of, of something we did. This, this is, I mean, for our, our friends in, in industry and our alumni, you know, organizations, the, the space of knowledge management and, you know, creation, repository, sharing and so on. I mean, we're, we're living that. Mm -hmm. And I will say, um, we couldn't be more proud of our five fellows and our faculty and the rest of campus, as, as you know, looks to us. And we, what the work of the five fellows really did take a little bit of load off of campus last summer in the fall, because a lot of other schools weren't as far along as we were um, with regard to teaching remotely. But I think as Shirley and Pam have described, many of the learnings 
are just going to be brought back into the to a regular face to face classroom. You still are using technology to drive certain things, but the pedagogy around what you're trying to do with students is applicable, I think, regardless of the delivery platform. And I think that's really important. Do, Shirley or Pam, do you have any um, any kind of things that surprised you or that you <laughs> learned? I mean, that's the one thing is, you know, you when you do these things, you, you're kind of bringing your expertise to the mm -hmm. faculty. What were, did you go away learning something that you're now going to take to your classes uh, that you thought was kind of cool? I learned lots of little things, I guess, lots of tips and technique, techniques that I can use in the classroom. And I, that wasn't really a surprise. I guess I expected that to happen. But my favorite thing is really what Shirley just showed you. And I think I'll use sort of a, a spreadsheet version of a note catcher uh, mm -hmm. this fall in my advanced accounting course. I think for small group work in a classroom, uh, it's going to work really, really well. Mm -hmm. That's great. Great. Well, Cheryl, I, do you I, have any? I, I would say, I mean, I, first of all, I learned a lot from the other faculty. I mean, because you, you, you seriously, every small discussion like that, being in a breakout room and, and learning and even, you know, thinking about maybe a challenge that I didn't encounter yet, but suddenly already had, you know, uh, a group of students that had this situation. And then the next semester I have it. So I, I kind of learn all the time. So it's these little things. So for me, it's really the getting closer to the faculty. I feel that we were more of a mentor role we were not the experts that told them what to do. We were there to facilitate uh, communication among faculty and sharing of best practices, sharing of challenges so that we can move forward. So, you know, we had the experience last spring, we took that and we said, how can we improve the fall? Then we learned from that, both from students and from faculty moved. That, and I think we're gonna do now, you know, hopefully, I don't know where the future is going to be. We're gonna say, okay, if we're going back to campus, because we're not going back to 2020, we're gonna have to look at 2021 with a new frame and new lenses, right? So our vision is not gonna be 2020, it's gonna be 2021. And we need to be able to say, okay, how do we take what we learned from that you know, in the different settings, the different disciplines and move it now back to campus or the, any hybrid. I don't know what's going to, where we're going to be, but move it to the next section. Yeah, that's wonderful. Well, good. Well, thank you both. And, and thanks to our other fellows and, and all the faculty who were involved, which was a good chunk of them and, and doctoral students, as you mm -hmm. pointed out, um, it really has helped us. And I, and I think our students, uh, the Eisenberg students, by and large, despite not being able to be physically on mm -hmm. campus with us and with us overall, um, have been very pleased. So, um, and really attest to your commitment to the school. So, Allison, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Um, uh, I think we might have some other um, uh, questions. Uh, yep, we definitely do. Um, and again, I'll encourage people, I, I see a couple of questions are coming in. I know Gregory's um, answering one, but um, we'll start with these and then we'll circle back to the ones that are being submitted. So the first question we received was, um, to Anne, how will the pandemic affect teaching and learning in the nearer and longer terms and related, how will new technology change things for the average student and graduate? Yeah, I mean, I think um, I think we heard a little bit about that from from our panel today um, uh, with regard to teaching and learning in the near term. Obviously, we've been doing things uh, in a remote fashion. I think that will uh, continue. We've learned a lot. I think Eisenberg's learned a lot. I think higher education has learned a lot, and I think the expectations of the learner have changed. Right? They, they, the use of technology, the pedagogy they have a better understanding of what works for them and what doesn't work for them. And so um, we're not going to be able in the future to just get, over, get away with just, you know, voiceover PowerPoint slides, right? I think we're going to see more interactive, more um, uh, produced content when we're talking about remote delivery. Um, so I think that the, the pandemic has changed expectation. I think it's changed it for the, um, the faculty as well the kind of support that they need, the kind of things that they want to do. Um, I also think what's important for us is to also realize, and our, our alumni appreciate this, and I've talked to a number of people in industry um, about this, you know, work has changed. And the fact we've kind of learned that we are able to do some things remotely very well, people are very effective, um, how does remote work factor into returning to the office, right? I think we're going to, I think that's something that organizations, including higher education, are going to be grappling with going forward in, in the very near future. 
Um, I think it also means that students, our graduates, are going to be have to have a, a knowledge of the tools and technologies that they're able to leverage them. And I don't mean just what button do I push to make some technology work, but how do I use the technology as a means to an end? The things that Shirley and Pam and Gregory were talking about is how do I be um, a high performing team? And I'm using technology to support my team, but how do I still function as a high performing team? So those are all the things that we're talking about and thinking about as we look at um, moving forward, uh, you know, over the coming months and into, into the coming years as a result of the pandemic. I think it's opened people's eyes and it's creating some very good opportunities for us. Okay, great. Um, another question we received um, in advance today is, um, what do we need to remain competitive with other business schools? And how does this particular priority intersect with the other priorities we've been discussing over the last couple of months? Yeah, I, I mean, I think, you know, as, as I've described in other contexts, you know, Eisenberg, you know, we've, you know, we are considered among the best business schools. There's no question about that. And, and part of it is because we've been innovative, innovative in all we do and, and in teaching and learning. Our recruiters know that. Our students are prepared to walk into organizations on day one and perform. Um, but for us to continue to do that, we're going to have to make investments in upskilling, continuing to upskill not only our faculty, but our staff who support us, who support students and support faculty. So some of the things that I look at and talk to other business schools and see what they're doing, you know, they're investing in testing out new technologies. They're bringing technologies into um, their environments and making them available to faculty, staff, and students to play with. I give you just a very simple technology, and this has been around now for a while, is 3D printing. And the use of 3D printing to produce prototypes in a marketing class. And we're prototyping something and we're gonna to try to sell it. Um, that's just one example. You know, We need to have those kinds of tools and technologies available to our students to play with, for our faculty to play with, for faculty to figure out how to integrate into their courses. Gregory's doing this with 3D um, environments. Well, where else might that fit in some of our teaching and learning? Organizations are adopting it. We need to adopt it and play with it as well. And so that's, to Allison, to your question, that's what we need to keep. And by the way, this is going to be the challenge. Over the last year, everybody was forced to play in technology spaces. And they now think they can do it. And so this is why I said from day one, we need to up our game. And those are the kinds of investments that we've been making over the last year to up our game, to stay ahead of the pack. So this next question is actually related. And, and I know you just gave one example with the 3D printing, but the question had come in, um, you know, can you give examples of the technology that the school needs? Yeah. And um, what is the, the, techn the uh, technology sandbox? Yeah, um, and some of you may have heard me talk about this. Um, you know, when we think about examples of technology, and I use 3D printing partially because I was doing something with a 3, 3D printer this morning, um, is when you think about the different areas, and I'll, I'm just going to pick on marketing, not pick on marketing, but use them as an example, um, and, and myself and all of us as consumers, well, different technologies like augmented reality is becoming quite pervasive. So I am interested in a new chair and I'm looking at the chair online or I'm looking at it on my mobile device through augmented reality, I can place that chair so I can see what it looks like in my living room, right? Um, work um, on manufacturing floors with um, virtual reality, augmented reality, mixed reality, those are the kinds of things that our students across various disciplines need to get exposure to and need to be able to play with. That also means that our faculty that teach in those spaces and do research in those spaces, they too need to have access to those tools and technology. So when I talk about a technology sandbox is what I would like to create within the school, and we're gonna need some, I'm gonna be honest with our alumni and friends, we're gonna need some help to do this, is to create a sandbox where we um, purchase technologies, 
We make them available to faculty, staff, and students to play with. They can get integrated. Um, if you think about um, 3D printing, I could see that being integrated into a new product development class and students are prototyping and building out some 3D models. Um, I could see augmented reality um, being used in some of our operations classes and some simulations in and around manufacturing floors as but one example. You know, those are just some of the very simple examples that we need to put tools. Um, FinTech, um, financial technologies for our students in finance, all of those things need to be made available to our students. And, and you know, working with our business partners so that our students are prepared to go out the door and they walk in the door and they say, I understand that. I know how it works. I can leverage it to, to, to ends for some organization. So those are the kinds of things. And by the way, you know, Allison, I didn't address this. You asked, how does this intersect with our other priorities? We've talked about, um, you know, uh, one of our priorities is attracting exceptional students. We need to innovate in teaching and learning. We need to have the most current and forward thinking technologies, artificial intelligence, right? All these kinds of things that attracts exceptional students. They want to come to a cutting edge business school. And so that's important to us. It's important to career success because they'll be prepared to compete for the best internships and jobs. It's important to sustaining our faculty because they need to have these things available. I, I, I was very excited with the 3D stuff. This is the research I do. So I would love to play with Vermilla, right? I mean, those are the tools that we need to have available. So anyway. Okay, another question we had, and then we'll get to, uh, there's a couple in the Q&A, but um, this one came in is, uh, and it relates to what you just talked about, how is the current technology need funded? Um, how much support would Eisenberg need to accomplish its goals in, in the technology and innovation space? Yeah, we, you know, right now we fund our uh, technology needs and, and um, largely through either our current operating budget, you know, we get some monies obviously um, allocated to Eisenberg from campus, from the university system. But a lot of the extras um, that we, that I'm talking about, um, these extra kind of things, we fund largely through the support of our alumni and our donors. Um, these are extra things above and beyond. And if we're going to be doing um, you know, our, for example, our teaching fellows program, um, and I need to acknowledge this to our alumni, um, that was funded out of the Dean's Excellence Fund. And the Dean's Excellence Fund, of course, was monies that were raised from our alumni to support initiatives in the school. And so the um, teaching fellows program was funded out of that. Um, when we go and I and uh, thinking about Verbella and the licensing contract, that is funded out of the Dean's Excellence Fund. So these, these are the things where we really do rely on our alumni and industry friends to help us do things, especially if, it's, if we're trying to explore something. And I will say, uh, this hopefully Pam and Shirley aren't gonna hear this, the return on the investment to the school of what we use to support the Teaching Fellows Program, the return on the investment was enormous. We could never have paid for it. If we had to go out and hire consultants to do what these five faculty did, we could not have paid for it. So, um, so we try to be very good stewards of our gifts from our friends and stewards of our resources, but we, we do need help to go forward. I'm sure they are listening to that, that they're under ROI, but okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we don't want them to hear that. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to, there was a question that came in through the Q&A, and I don't mean to put you on the spot. And I know George isn't here to talk research, but it's an interesting question um, from Emily who said, is there any research being conducted by UMass faculty? Um, you know, I we probably know more about I, Eisenberg faculty in particular, but maybe UMass on the impact of the pandemic on learning and higher education. There, that's a great question. And the answer is yes, it's a resounding yes. Um, not just from within um, Eisenberg, because we do have faculty that are looking at, um, you know, as, as kind of Shirley and Pam alluded to, you know, what's effective and what's not effective. I mean, they did a very uh, relatively simple survey at the end of the fall semester to figure out, you know, what, what was working with students and what wasn't. There are more formal um, studies going on in campus in different settings. Um, psychological and brain sciences, the School of Education, some of our faculty as well. 
So looking at this both in terms from very different perspectives, some of it deals with pedagogy, what works, you know, online versus face to face. Some of it deals with the um, health and well-being of students, um, as many of us have read articles that um, being socially isolated is very, very difficult for all of us, in particular students. So there's a variety of studies going on in different settings around the effect of the pandemic on higher education. I, I will say we've done everything, I hope, everything that we can to support our students, um, both their mental health, their well-being, as well as their educational attainment. Um, we're, we've been paying close attention to it and we'll continue to do that as well. Okay, so um, that's the, the questions I have that were submitted and I know we're reaching the hour. So, um, Anne, I'll turn it back to you for uh, closing thoughts. Yeah, I just, Allison, thank you very much for, for managing the questions for us. Um, I, I do, I, I wanna thank everybody again for taking time out over your lunch to join us today. And I wanna thank Pam and Shirley and Gregory as well for, for both the work you've been doing and, and sharing it with us and all the faculty and staff who've been working in inspiring and teaching and learning space this past year. Um, we love having a chance to tell our alumni and friends what we're doing, um, especially in and around our priorities and the initiatives that we already have in place or that we're gonna be pushing forward. And so we're gonna keep you um, up to date. We've got a couple more sessions later this spring um, we have, I, let me just check the date on this. I believe it is April 15th is our next um, uh, lunchtime chat. And on that, during that chat, we're gonna be talking about sustaining faculty excellence. And when I talk about sustaining faculty excellence, both from uh, a research perspective, but we've heard a little bit about excellence with regard to teaching and learning spaces. And we'll also touch on some of our doctoral students. So we'll get some of our faculty in and you get to see them. Many of you as alums will know some of these faculty. So look for an email that will be coming in the, in the next uh, couple of weeks. And we look forward to the next session. And again, this, I hope you can appreciate, I think this one really is an exciting space for me and I love talking about it. So thanks everybody. Have a great weekend and thanks to the panel. I love you guys. You're wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you everybody. Thank you everyone.